Thank you to the London School of Architecture for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, how can our buildings and cities work together to achieve net zero? Um, it's probably, you know, the most, uh, one of the most important questions of, of today and also uh, one of the most complicated to answer, no doubt. Um, but I'm going to have a bit of a stab and make a few recommendations at the end. Um, and in the kind of spirit of this being an academic institution, uh, you know, there'll be a few provocations in here, and may maybe some stuff which is, uh, uh, you know, highly contentious. So, so I, I, I welcome um, the questions and, and, and the discussion that will follow, I'm sure. Um, a bit about me and a bit about us. Um, I'm sure you all are familiar with the practice of Foster and Partners. Um, there is uh, about 1,400 of us here in London, uh, in Battersea, spread across six campuses, um, uh, and around 1,800 globally. And what this really, you know, what I really kind of would stress is that we are we have this kind of gravity and, and this magnitude of people of different specialisms and different, uh, you know, areas of expertise and different approaches to the topic of sustainability or sustainable design. Um, and that's the kind of fantastic thing about us. And what I'm presenting today is, and this is a really important point, what I'm presenting today is, is really a, a kind of Frankenstein uh, in a, well, it's not so much a, a kind of less monstrous Frankenstein, but it's 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 a combination of of the output and the research of many different teams and specialities. It's not just myself, and I'm I'm in the urban design team. Uh, the, it relies a lot on the uh, the transport team, uh, the sustainability team, um, and uh, the materials team, structures team, and so on. Because sustainability is inherently a um, multidisciplinary topic and uh, we need lots of brains working together uh, to solve it. Um, this is the urban design team, which, which I'm uh, a part of. I'm a, a bit about me. Um, introduce yourself uh, slightly into the presentation, but that's, that's okay. A, a bit about me. So I actually studied architecture as my, as my first degree and, and then uh, through, the, through, the, uh, you know, through practice and working in architecture firms, I realized, soon realized that actually cities uh, were my real passion. And I've had a bit of a, uh, a strange journey, which has taken me away from architecture and back to architecture. Um, and now I'm, you know, in the realm of looking at both the spaces between buildings and buildings and how they interact. And I hope to kind of give you a quick glimpse, cover a lot of breadth and not so much depth into some of the stuff that we've been doing uh, in recent years and, and how we've begun, begun to think about it. Um, and as another kind of introduction to Foster and Partners, we think about sustainability um, across the whole spectrum of environmental, social and governance topics. Uh, we have our own responsibility framework, which is heavily inspired by the UN Sustainable Development Goals, of which energy and carbon um, is just one of, of 10 key topics. And that's just important to bear in mind because though this presentation is going to heavily focus on carbon emissions. Um, there's lots of other things and there's lots of other ways that design uh, can have a positive impact, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, so moving on to the UK. Um, the good. We have, for the most part, as, as a nation, kind of trundled along at, at a fairly you know, steady pace of growth from around 1200 up until the 1800s and the turn of the Industrial Revolution. And then all of a sudden, uh, our kind of gross domestic productivity skyrocketed um, as people began to move to cities uh, and we began to mine coal and, and, uh, and burn it for, for energy. Um, and all of these things are kind of interrelated. The rise of the urban population, the rise of, of carbon emissions and the rise of productivity, um, though not necessarily in this order. Um, it's all a kind of interdependent uh, uh, growth. But I mean, the crucial thing is our cities expand and become more productive and consume more energy um, in time. And what we really care about um, 
in this country as as as, as kind of individuals and in, and in mainstream politics we really like the idea of cities we still like to move to cities and be part of all of the amenities and and wonderful work opportunities and the social life that cities offers uh, and we'd like to be productive and to have economic growth and to increase our quality of life but we want to kind of uh, you know ultimately we want to decouple the carbon from the equation we want to consume uh, well not necessarily less energy we want to consume less carbon um, and looking at this uh, at a city level and this is done by c40 cities um, housing and commercial buildings and transport together, and they're all very interrelated, account for about 85% of urban emissions. Um, so that's CO2 equivalent emissions. And then across the globe, and this is um, figures from Architecture 2030, uh, building construction and operations, so the embodied carbon and operational carbon in buildings, uh, account for around a third of global greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, whereas transport accounts for around 23% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And my big question or my kind of structure for this presentation is, you know, it's not just about how we design our buildings and, and you know, the materials that we choose and the m and &E systems that we install. It's also highly dependent on where. Um, there was a, a very, fantastic documentary of course uh is it um, once upon a time called um how much does your building weigh mr foster and that was really a kind of challenge or a provocation uh for high tech high tech architecture and its sustainability credentials and the idea being that you know by using less steel or less less uh you know heavy carbon intensive um or at least this is my interpretation today the the idea of using less carbon intensive materials and making our buildings lighter uh, actually means we have a lighter footprint on the planet more or less on balance but you know my kind of you know secondary uh question to this is is where is your building located mr foster you know there's factors which we can't control um within the kind of building plot well we can control them to a certain extent but there's factors uh which exist in the whole life assessment uh, of a building, um, which are heavily dependent on the building's location in a in a city or in a context. So, if we look at the a kind of typical sixty year journey of a building, this is a uh, um, this is a whole life life cycle carbon assessment, which we did recently um, for an unnamed project. Um, but the, you know, we often find that the embodied carbon accounts for something, you know, typically in the region of, of sort of 30 to 50 percent. The operational carbon uh, could similarly, the operational carbon related to the building only, um, maybe around sort of 20 to 30 percent. But we often find that the transport element, and this is the, the trips, the cumulative uh, some of the trips that people take to and from the building, whether if that's a place of work or uh, perhaps a, a retail destination, whatever it is, um, the the scope three emissions associated with transport are um, a, an incredibly significant volume of carbon emissions at a at looking at a whole life cycle uh, assessment for a building. There we go. Um, and in a world where everyone is making commitments to uh, carbon neutrality and the Paris Agreement, uh, limiting the global temperature rise to two degrees, um, companies alike uh, are making pledges. We have to look at the whole picture. Um, so what does this mean? It means looking at both the building and and the ways that people travel to and from the building, the built environment around the building. Um, a recent project that we have, uh, it's actually just opened, um, is Axiona Ombu in Madrid. Um, it's located over here uh, in the southeast area of Madrid. Um, a bit of context, Axiona uh, was a kind of gas and utilities company and this building was previously used to house uh, machinery for the gas works um, and it was kind of 
given to us like this in a way um a kind of emptied out building uh with some great structure uh lots of kind of natural light into the building and and um this refurbishment was targeting uh it was a commercial refurbishment uh for the offices uh headquarters refurbishment um and some of the key things or design uh you know design implementations that we made um before we get onto transport looking at the bigger picture uh we wanted this to be a green campus uh including approximately 12,000 meters squared of of landscape and this is this is very important as well um for reasons i will shortly get on to uh we planted 300 trees across the site and and uh, we delivered on a number of operational uh kpis such as using uh 80 of the water uh or making 80 percent of the water reusable across the landscape um, and this is the kind of uh, this is the finished project pr product, um, and and uh, it's largely a refurbishment replacing the floor. Uh, there's a number of different structural elements which we kept in place, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, and the kind of key um, built element, the key structure within the building which we proposed was a, a cross laminated timber uh, office. Uh, and multifunction space. Um, so this used 400 meters cubed of blue lamb and 1,200 meters cubed uh, of CLT from sustainable timber sources. Uh, and in total, um, the, sequ the sequestration uh, potential of this timber um due to the sustainable forestry practices and, and low transportation cost was actually able to reduce our total carbon um by 1640 uh, um, tons of, of co2 um and that's all very important and and exciting and and this is these are the kind of key architectural headlines of the project um but I want to talk about, or I at least want to keep the focus on uh, this relationship to the city. And one of the great gifts of this site um, was it was uh, located near to Estacion Madrid um, in the southeast, in the southeast uh, side of the city. Um, and previously at this location, uh, you can see uh, a huge amount of the the surrounding land and a huge huge amount of land around the red line boundary uh, was simply surface car parking. Um, and one of our kind of key goals and in, in the kind of creating a green landscape uh, was really about taking this grey barren landscape and, and turning it green for you know all of the wonderful reasons which we associate with uh, which we generally associate with. Uh, kind of ecological design and landscape design and biophilia and you know increased productivity and, and, and creating a natural amenity within the site but more crucially um, by reducing the surface parking on site we were able to change our modal split um, we were able to uh, nudge people away from taking their car to work uh, in favor of adopting rail and and bus journeys as as well as uh, cycling, so that restoration of the landscape and creating a green landscape um, uh, was wonderful in its own right. But it also enabled us to begin to tackle this 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 uh, this topic of of carbon emissions uh, over the lifespan of a building from uh, transport. So we estimate that our design proposals uh, lead to a 50% car reduction in trips to and from the site and um, our method for evaluating all of this is uh, hybrid input output methodology uh, which looks at the whole kind of process of um, you know designing uh, you know the structures and facades the embodied carbon elements the fit outs that will, will be required over the lifespan of a or the refurbishments that will, will be required over the lifespan of a, of a project, uh, the operational energy and, and water consumption in use, and and the uh, transport emissions. And 
are carbon emissions from um, from Axiona Ombu uh, totaled uh, 11.7 tons over the lifespan of the building. You'll notice that this is a energy neutral building um, due to the sustainable sourcing of electricity. Uh, the um, largest elements of the uh, largest elements of emissions within the building um, in this scenario are the uh, embodied carbon and and the transport emissions. Uh, we've got a kind of quick uh, graphic here which indicates how this is could be visualized. So that's 7.9 percent or 7.9 tons within uh, the the embodied carbon, 2.2 uh, tons in the operational and transport carbon um, uh, total life cycle emissions. And this actually yields a rise according to our ecological footprinting methodology. I'm happy to talk a bit more about that. Um, of a, it's associated with a two degrees uh, Celsius uh, uh, rise in, um, in, in in global temperatures. So that's within the Paris Agreement uh, commitments. So the uh, just a quick note on the methodology, the ecolo ecological footprint methodology uh, looks at the uh, sources of carbon and the sinks and considers things uh, like land take uh, and the emissions from, from this building or this, this refurbishment uh, were at a at a point running through the methodology where they uh, yielded a net zero um, temperature rise of two degrees. Uh, and then there's a quick um, summary of some of the other KPIs that this building addressed, not just focusing on carbon. Um, but kind of coming back to London, this is where I'll introduce a bit of our our research and our thinking and our, our urban methodology. Um, we love to think about our, our, our kind of home turf and, and our cities and how mobility networks connect to uh, residential population densities and how those connect to, you know, where places of, sorry, excuse me, people's places of work. In London, we have, uh, you know, a small variation amongst residential density, a moderate increase in the city centre, not as much as other cities in the world. But it's very clear that it's a, there's a, a monocentricity associated with London, lots of jobs located in the centre. And what does it mean to have people commuting uh, from inner London or outer London suburbs into the centre of the city? Um, and this is a, a space and tax analysis of London, a, a depth map of um, connectivity from the existing road network. Um, and and this is obviously, uh, I mean, it was built by the Romans, and this is one of the key driving forces uh, behind uh, the urban development of London, naturally, uh, development following the spines of, of the city originally. Um, Yet there is a um, a kind of cost to having uh, a city, or as most cities are developed around a road network, there's an associated cost with that, um, a carbon cost and a behavioural cost as people predominantly, uh, or at least in the past, have adopted more unsustainable forms of transport, namely the private motor vehicle. Um, this is a P-Town map of London. Um, and, you know, we're very interested in this interrelationship between um, land uses and mobility networks uh, and people's modal split across different um, transport options, whether that be kind of car or, uh, or public transport. This is some research in progress and the kind of full version will later be um, or soon be uh, revealed by my uh, colleague Julio, who is a mobility planner uh, at, a, at a, a conference in a couple of months. 
uh, but we're you know we're very interested or we're kind of fascinated by this idea that there are approximately 300 million uh oh, sorry three million daily commutes uh from people's homes to to workplaces within the city um and we like to sort of bash our heads together and think about um ways that we can get better at understanding uh how our commuting patterns are interrelated to our carbon uh, emissions. And if you remember, Axion or Ombu was located very close to a, a, a railway station and a metro station. The, you know, one of the kind of predominant factors of London uh, or one of the biggest indicators of what your carbon emissions might be, at least on your, on your journeys to and from work, uh, is actually which borough you live in, or, or here we've actually got um, MSOAs uh, or, or smaller output areas. But in short, if you live in if you live in the city centre, if you live in, in London, if you live in Hackney, um, your emissions uh, getting to work are likely to be considerably lower uh, per person um, than 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 living out in the suburbs. And you might be saying, well, that's, you know, that's obvious, Simon. Um, we, we kind of all know that. But by beginning to quantify it and by beginning to model it, uh, we can actually develop our own methodologies for evaluating potential changes uh, in mobility networks in London and, and in other cities. And this is what we've, we've begun to do. Um, you know, we have begun to ask questions. Um, and this is this is a more uh, this is kind of focusing on not just journeys to work but leisure journeys as well included, and we like to ask questions like what if more people cycled to work or no, sorry cycled or or took public transport, what if every borough had a modal split uh, like Islington, I believe this was the kind of question we were asking here, um, and 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 we've um, you know I would love to go into the methodology a bit more, but. I will, I will conveniently uh, um, screen past that for now, but you know, essentially this looks at a, um, it fabricates a trip generation model and associates modal splits with the different uh, trips based on, based on the existing network and availability of public transport networks. Um, and and we like to ask questions like questions like what if more people cycled and took public transport and we estimate there will be a 32% reduction in in vehicle associated carbon emissions in London uh, or what if we had 15 minute cities across uh, across the entirety of the city um, you know what if people didn't have to get in their car for example to to uh, go shopping uh, in the suburbs that's where some of the key carbon savings come from. Um, so that's just a small taster of some of the thinking we're beginning to do and and you know we apply some of this method methodology and thinking into other larger scale large scale urban projects that we do and provocationally i'm going to present you know four um four design interventions at an urban scale which i think uh carry probably the most effectiveness uh, for their their kind of cost or, or ease of implementing, um, and uh, this is um, you know I welcome discussions from the floor about this later. I mean, there's obviously a lot more than four steps, um, but I think these are some of the most important things. Um, we love, as humans, as inhabitants of public space, we love tight knit old urban centres. We don't like kind of big, sprawling, uh, you know, more American style development, which is heavily car dependent. You know, we like the kind of Soho's or Farringdon's of, of London, or we love these places. We don't necessarily love um, the large surface kind of big box retail or big box entertainment uh, developments, which we associate. Uh, with places like Canada Water, for example, albeit this is being redeveloped uh, as we speak. Um, you know, which place would you prefer to be in? I, I think that, you know, as as we've, we demonstrated in Ombu, 
by removing car parking spaces, we estimate a 50% reduction in in, uh, in in vehicle trips to and from the site. And and it varies dramatically um, depending on where you are and the methodology used to calculate this. But um, surface parking uh, is something which you know we believe is. Uh, mostly not appropriate in, in 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 cities there's a huge kind of um opportunity to be gained and this is you know one of the key um one of the key findings from our research that you know the ptau and the access towards mobility efficient mobility networks is paramount um we cannot we cannot use the stick alone. You can't reduce car parking spaces. Well, you cannot reduce car parking spaces without also improving your public transport network. Uh, is 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 our general philosophy. People need a stick and a carrot to adopt impacting and widespread behavioural change towards towards more sustainable travel patterns. Um, we've done. A number of projects in Canary Wharf over the years, including uh, the under London Underground Network, and more recently, um, we've looked at the Crossrail Station, uh, which has been built and uh, uh, and is and is finalised. and And we're also involved in some of the uh, projects around this, the the more denser denser towers, um, and. I use this example just to highlight the 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 you know the impact of um, creating excellent mobility networks around dense development. We we also in in this scenario in this circumstance um, use the opportunity of the roof space at the Canary Wharf station to create a, a bit of public realm, a kind of vibrant gar garden, uh, park, spa park space in the uh, in the center of the city or the center of the of the central business district. Um, and uh, and it's it's this combination of you know using design and public space to create places where people want to be uh which also shifts the balance and you know it makes people more ready to use public transport uh more keen to use public transport and all of the factors which enable a more widespread behavioral shift um i'm particularly interested in in the idea of designing for active transport and this obviously permeates um our master plans all across the world. There is a desire to uh, incorporate cycle lanes and electric bike parking and cargo bike parking um, in many of our master plans across um, across different nations. Uh, it's one of the most effective ways of, you know, the encouraging the behavioural shift from driving uh, to cycling is one of the most effective ways of reducing our carbon emissions for obvious reasons. Bikes and walking and, and running have virtually zero emissions. Um, and, you know, it's not always particularly easy. Um, the, I love to think about the um, low traffic neighborhood concepts and their, their kind of uh, dispersal across London kind of in pre-COVID and, and 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 COVID COVID days. Um, and you know the this is of they have obviously become incredibly politicized and and incredibly hated by some because they obstruct uh, people's car journeys. Um, and you know this is something that we you know uh, like to look at as well. Um, one of the kind of key principles of of mobility design of mobility design uh, like i said is you know we provide better public transport networks or better active transport networks but we also um, don't shy away from making uh, traditional private car journeys a little bit more difficult and and 
the the impacts of um, the low uh, low traffic neighbourhoods in different London boroughs uh, are super interesting to us. We've found um, enormous uh, increases of um, of excuse me. We found enormous increases of um, Um, mobility, uh, sustainable mobility adoption uh, within the low traffic neighbourhoods, but they did have the uh, effect of diverting um, traffic. I'll just refine my thread of thought. Excuse me. And um, you know, finally, I'm moving away from London here to Amravati, but I think it's important to keep the bigger picture in mind at at all times. Um, this is an opportunity which is only afforded to designers when uh, you do have the, the potential to um, design a master plan uh, at, a, at an urban scale, um, where you can actually control or, or designate the, the areas of, of, of or the nodes in the mobility network, designing mixed use dense neighborhoods around them. Um, and thinking about the spaces in between uh, um, what we've what I'm showing here is a, a, a capital city design project um, which has currently been stalled uh, but it's based in uh, Amravati in Andhra Pradesh India and the the um, you know the key we had a number of key goals here, including uh, our carbon emissions. Um, and we are in the practice of building tools which align to our uh, initial responsibility framework, which I presented at the start, um, and which include uh, accommodation or, or, or thought and and application of a number of different uh, topics in the in the total sustainability framework, um, of which sustainable mobility uh, is obviously a huge uh, and and incredibly important um, aspect of. Um, and I mean I'm I offer these as as kind of examples as, as to some of the thinking that we do on different projects. And then returning to Amravati, and some of the tools that we have uh, that we, we have built and, and, and designed, um, you know, we like to use uh, modeling and 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 uh, you know, three D modeling tools uh, as interactive design tools to address some of these issues about. Uh, the whole spectrum of sustainability, whether that be uh, water use, or whether that be access to green space, or whether that be the mobility network and 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 the kind of carbon associated with with um, both the embodied carbon in the in the structures that we're proposing and and in the more kind of scope three emissions zone of how people move around the city, um, and. You know, in summary, I mean, I think there's an, an imperative where we can to think beyond the red line boundary of the building. It's, you know, the tools that we can employ within traditional architectural projects are, are in some ways limited. We can control car parking spaces. We can control public realm to a certain extent. We can control uh, bike parking spaces and and begin to kind of uh, offer people that that nudge towards the more sustainable approach, but ultimately, um, you know, without the uh, implementation of, of better public public transport systems, of you know more um, transport demand led uh, methods of of um, shifting our modal split. Uh, like the low traffic neighborhoods and without the ultimately the joined up thinking uh, which enables us to create efficiencies in our cities and look at the whole um, 
environmental, social, and governance sustainability topics, top sustainability topics at large, um, we uh, we ultimately have an imperative to 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 work across the kind of layers of of, of built environment development, um, even if it's not necessarily in our brief. Um, so I'll stop there, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for a really interesting. I mean, I'm glad it was breadth because there's just so much to cover. Um, depth is a is a yeah. Um, it could could be a, we could be here for many days, I suspect. Um, so I thank you so much for giving us such a, an incredible um, overview of of the approach that Foster and Partners are take and some of the tools that you develop and use um, in the in your process. Thank um, you. Really interesting. I'm going to, um, I'm keeping an eye on the chat room. I haven't seen in, uh, an awful lot of traffic in there yet. So I'm going to encourage everybody to please you know, get questions in um, as, as quickly as you can. Otherwise, we'll, um, we will run out of time, I suspect. So I, I, I urge you all to, to think about what you want to ask Simon while you've got this amazing opportunity. Um, in the meantime, while, while I... Uh, give everyone a bit of time to think. Um, I have a couple of questions, I think, just to sort of kick things off. We've got about 15, 15 minutes, I think. Um, so I just wondered if um, yeah. you could say a little bit more about, I mean, I, I thought what was really is really interesting when you start to think of, uh, beyond the red boundary line of the building. And then you start to think about, about the kind of boundary of the city in a sense and many of your the the maps that you you showed of greater london you know they, they clearly have an age but they get dark away, away. Oh, yeah. well, I, I, um, hello i think we've got some some background news somewhere but uh maybe they'll whoever it is can turn their mute on um uh yes they, they're sort of dark ridges of the edge of the city and this sort of business of 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 multimodal split of transport um from one's experience of of moving beyond the edge of greater london tends to be that's where the where there's a lot of car movement um and it's you know you get your car to get to the station um to get into london uh and i just wondered if if it is it if there is anywhere in the thinking at Foster's sort of where where do you sort of define that edge of the city really? I can see from a kind of quantifying point of view you've got to stop it somewhere, but I just wondered if there's there at any point in the discussion um, that kind of edge of the city into what I suppose we would call either commuter belt or then um, rural space. And, and what that kind of dialogue, how does that sort of impact really that these conversations about connectivity? Yeah, absolutely. I think London is a very interesting case, right? Because mm -hmm. we have a green belt, we have an excellent public transport network, uh, uh, you know, an excellent sort of regional transport network, let's say, um, mm -hmm. the railway lines. And, and there's the result is that a number of people, I think, it's around 800,000 or, you know, somewhere between 800,000 and a million, at least pre-COVID, um, would, you know, take long journeys on, on from beyond the green belt, from sort of semi-rural locations or from the kind of home counties, towns uh, mm -hmm. into, the, into the city. Um, and, and we, in our modeling that we uh, undertook here, we had to discount those, those, those trips and that, that, that kind of, in inter city commuting flow um because i th you know ultimately it's a great benefit of uh, you know the the last mile is yeah secondarily i think the last mile is often one of the the most uh, carbon emissive periods of of, of transport mm -hmm. right if you i'm i can't quite you know pull the figures from my mind but mm -hmm. you know essentially mm -hmm. i know that rail travel is is 
relatively low carbon intensity, uh, even over greater distances, whereas a, a kind of 15 minute car journey stuck in traffic in the city uh, with, um, you know, potentially uh, hundreds of thousands of people doing that at the same time yeah um is is incredibly emitting and and not it, it's not just the kind of like carbon emissions which are the issue but that's it's also an issue for the uh efficiency and function of the mobility network in the city right mm -hmm. so um you know i think it's a, i think it's a great question i think it's you know the other the other kind of component which occurs to you know occurs to me recently is you know we've had some big storms in in recent mm -hmm. days right and and uh, we now have a new option which is not I'll, I'll i'll get a train or a bus and then walk the rest of the way to work or i'll get a bus and then a taxi or whatever um there's also just the working from home option now which mm -hmm. is which is in its own way you know a positive transformational shift generally or potentially on on our kind of emissivity as individuals, but um, it, the downside is it also encourages people to potentially move beyond the city boundary, like you said. And there was a huge kind of uplift in house values outside of London during COVID. Though it looks like people are sort of beginning to move back now, mm. um, according to the, the most recent data. But um, you know, I think that we, regardless of of that kind of line of thinking you know there's there's still people are always going to need city centers um because they're so unique and they're so unique for work and they're so unique for leisure and entertainment and and that kind of social life that they offer um and it makes sense regardless to design our city centers with good connectivity between the sub centers uh um offered by public transport with fewer car parking spaces as as is the standard in london anyway now with you know um, essentially uh, zero parking allocation across most of the boroughs mm -hmm. uh, central london boroughs um so i mean these are all positive signs of of yeah. of of changing towards a more sustainable development pathway and i think it's just worth noting on that front that you know, some of our biggest challenges, both in terms of the embodied carbon of buildings and, and in the kind of uh, mobility networks, um, are occurring in rapidly developing countries, mm. um, which are experiencing both the highest population growth and, and usually the lowest um, capacities for the capital investment required to build out public transport systems. Mm. Um, so they often build you know, the sprawling cities uh, quite quickly uh, at low densities with a strong favorability towards car usage. Um, mm. And often, you know, with relatively high embodied carbon emissions because they're not densifying adequately. So, you know, one of our kind of you know, London is in some ways an easier case, or well, so is Madrid. A refurbishment of a building in, in Madrid is is a uh, it's almost a low hanging fruit. This you know this kind of brownfield first approach, which is by no means a, a new idea, um, mm. uh, kind of harking back to the urban task force um, of the nineties. But the mm. the you know the true challenge and, and what we also aspire to do in, in some of our largest kind of markets is to steer um, places in Asia or the Middle East or or, or um, South America into more development, uh, sustainable development pathways. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. I I guess I had, yes, I, I picking up on just one of your points, um, we've got a couple of questions have come in, but uh, one of your points really about this the business then of of the meaning of the city and yep. and what it what it what it now means to us you know the changing nature of what cities can do um you know their their value in a way and their uh, purpose is is sort of feels like it's beginning to act, to really change um because of this capacity to work from home and and then all of the 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 sort of social um 
issues that sort of come with that in a way, you know, people's relations to their work, how effective and productive they are, all of, all of those elements. Um, but I, but that sort of part of what it, what it, why, why come to cities um, at, at all? I mean, you say people will always need cities, and I, I wonder about that. We've sort of got to a point in our civilization where we just, we, we, we think it, we assume it, we know it. Um, and I just wondered when you're designing and you're thinking about maybe existing cities like London that have had gone through many, many different iterations um, and then perhaps new ones, uh, what you think are the, or what you're designing in to those cities that make them sort of meaningful now for the next 50 years, 100 years? Do you think about those things? Or yeah. How do you tackle those things? Well, I think there's, there's a number of factors to that. I, I think, you know, there is, wow, how, how to segregate them. I think mm -hmm. there's a general, there's a general, firstly, there's a sort of macroeconomic story or like mm -hmm. urban economic story. And, and it was once predicted um, in the kind of latter half of the 20th century that, you know, the evolution of uh, telecommunications and the rise of the internet and you know all of these technological factors would eliminate the need for cities mm. um, and in fact what happened um, and this is documented by uh, a number of a number of different academics but the one I'm familiar with is Andriguez Pose from London School of Economics and mm. his his sort of thesis is the world gets uh, the world doesn't get flatter it actually gets uh, more mountainous so cities are these kind of mountains or these these the and they have these spikes of um of you know economic productivity of population of workspace you know our city centers have intensified dramatically over the past sort of 30 years against almost the kind of wisdom that they maybe shouldn't have as, as mm. people are enabled to work more remotely um and one of the big kind of economic arguments for that is that people are more productive when they're based in these kind of agglomerations like clusters of businesses that are rely all on each other if if you look at city of london and the the lawyers and the insurance uh you know providers and 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 the ancillary kind of business service firms and the you know the graphic designers and you know all of these businesses work together in a lot of ways to to kind of you know ensure that their product is 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 legal is 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 marketable etc and so on and and the benefits of the, that kind of face-to-face -face interaction and the meeting the idea that you can you know spend 10 minutes on public transport uh, mm -hmm. and 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 head down the road and, and meet someone uh, for a, for you know to discuss kind of confidential information or or whatever mm -hmm. is, is is one of the kind of factors of of economic intensity that's led to the densification of city centers despite the kind of odds and then i mean i think the the other one is you know there's a very strong social psychological incentive for people um to adopt um to especially in the wake of covid and especially in the wake of kind of home working um, mm. is 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 the kind of value the authentic human interactions and the authentic mm. kind of cultural experiences uh, and the authentic night economy or, or whatever um, yeah. authentic opportunities to dance that that cities offer right yeah um, even if you're working mm. fully remote from you know uh, mm. the most beautiful beach house on the south coast you, you you know you still miss out on that kind of London energy and London buzz and mm. You know there's a bit of evidence to support that you know there's a number of people in there who are kind of forming families in their early 30s or late 20s who left london and uh, during the pandemic and who have who have come back that's mm -hmm. very kind of tentative and vague evidence at the moment but you know that those kinds of shifts and and that you know that kind of um the power of face-to-face -face social life and cultural experience um, is, you know, not to be, in, not it, to be it, underestimated. It, it's inimitable. But that's I mean that's yeah. that's what cities are are, are almost only capable of doing. Mm. 
really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, now, with, I'm conscious of time. I think we've got time for one more question. And we have one from Kyra Cousins, um, who, said, who asks, did you analyze how local pro public transport works? And did you ask locals whether the lack of parking would lead to people using their car for longer, trying to find parking? Um, so it's a sort of, yeah, um, web of parking. A, a, a multi-pronged prong question yeah. I, you, you know there's we use a number of different methodologies to uh you know estimate how people's modal split will change um one of them is is looking at you know the transport accessibility of of the network in a more general sense a bit like p mm -hmm. um another one that we use is uh floor space uh driven assessments um so that might be you know we can estimate the amount of workers that will be in a building or estimate the amount of users that will be in a building and and uh, and drive um kind of trip generation models from that which is you know based on on geography and 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 kind of um you know the what the evidence says people are already doing based on surveys mm -hmm. Uh, so we've we've kind of uh, we've got a resource that helps us do that, um, and then we use you know a collection of different, um, mostly derived from academic or mobility mobility modelling um, sort of research that will, can begin to uh, anticipate what happens um, when we provide more bike spaces in development or we, we begin to remove there's a kind of elasticity associated uh, a, a kind of action and consequence um so so you know these mm -hmm. you know if you provide x number more uh, or x number less parking spaces um and and actually generate those links to public transport that puts it within a kind of 10 minute walk threshold uh, we can expect an estimate of this kind of shift in the trip in the trip generation models um mm. to kind of give a to give a, a a kind of brief summary and you know the i mean the reality is these predictions are only as good as the kind of data that they've been based on mm. and uh you know behavioral economics and people's mobility decisions are a constantly evolving and changing beast um and especially like, you know, in, in a kind of post COVID world where work, working from home is, is, is now increasing in popularity, you know, this is a limitation in the, in the analysis that we actually perform. Mm. Um, but, but, you know, we, we use a number of different approaches and we rely on different evidence, which is specific to different countries and different cities. Uh, and we usually hope that, you know, by averaging out some different approaches, we, we end up with a reasonably reliable target. Mm. So we don't actually look at the, you know, we don't look at how the public transport works per se in terms of, um, you know, what the timetable looks like uh, mm. necessarily or or how well, the kind of experience of going to the station or, or, or that kind of thing is it, based on a lot more uh, metrics and evidence. Um, and then as to whether we ask local people about the you know whether the removal of parking would lead to people um uh kind of changing their mobility methods i think we have we, i mean we surveyed local people and and there's there's participatory design practices in in, in various projects and you know mobility and traveling to and from the site is often part of that and it's especially prevalent in our uh, user engagement surveys that the workplace team does and we do it we do it to ourselves as well so we 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 have a mobility survey in house where we ask people how they're getting to and from our campus in Battersea um, so this is this is a really important dimension that actually helps us to build better models I think um, I think this is where we do rely on people like TFL however um, mm. who are you know doing fantastic pieces of uh, research and monitoring um, about, you know, how the modal split changes from, you know, various different transport interventions and how things change from inner London to outer London journeys and outer London to outer London journeys. And, and, and they 
we have you know build a wealth of, of evidence and then the, i mean the final thing which is actually becoming really exciting for us is is um what i would call kind of mobile and telecommunications and basically internet service provider companies and there are certain cities i think it, i believe it's andorra which have begun to release open data sets which actually track how it's aggregated data so you can't determine what individuals are actually doing but how people move around their cities um in in the course of a day based on you know the location of their telephone so that's an interesting one and and i think this space is only going to be we're going to only be kind of going to, going to become more aware of how people move around their cities um or how people move around cities and 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 their kind of trip choices and what those decisions are influenced by uh, mm -hmm. in the future. Great. Well, I think that's an extremely good note to end on. Um, look to the future and know that we're um, we're constantly we're all of us, I suspect, providing that data as we speak, as we sit here, um, which is. Uh, pretty fascinating to know that it's then going to be in your hands to start to model um, future future shapes of our cities. So I um, really so very grateful for you to come and talk to us all today, Simon, um, and look forward to, to maybe future talks um, where we can get into some of the real nitty gritty uh, would be really fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thanks so much. Um, thank you all to um, our audience who have come and had lunch with us today. Um, it is now two minutes past two, so I suspect everybody will need to be going uh, on to the next part of their day. So I will um, send you on your way. And thank you um, again for joining us this year, 2223 series for Thursday Talks. Um, and watch this space for, for the new series coming up. Um, look forward to welcoming you all back again and if uh, and have a lovely summer in the meantime uh thank you simon um thank you very much see you and on a small note of optimism to end on okay bye <laughs> cheerio bye